My name is David Williams and I'm the Director of Marketing at Practice. Um, in short, Practice is an applied microlearning software that gives organizations um, a scalable means to frequently practice and reinforce skills and receive meaningful timely feedback uh, through the power of peer-to-peer -peer video assessment and coaching. And what I'm going to talk about today is applied microlearning in action. Um, I'll share what applied microlearning is, a few ways it's being measured, and then a few specific examples of how organizations are putting it into action. And more importantly, um, in this context, what the challenges were that those organizations uh, faced originally um, that made them come to the conclusion that applied microlearning was something that would help them try and address those challenges. Um, but before I start, I actually want to back up and reintroduce myself, um, but a little bit in a different way so, uh, than I did at the start. So my name is David Williams, and I'm a vendor. Um, and as much as it pains me to say that out loud, uh, all vendors pride themselves uh, on being different than other vendors, and I firmly believe that practice um, is different when it comes to our client relationships, um, but it's still the truth. Uh, you know it, and I know it, and there's no sense in avoiding it or, or really dancing around the underlying relationship, um, but essentially practice is a technology that companies and organizations purchase, period. Um, so by that nature, that makes practice a vendor. And I'm saying this all in the context of a recent editorial that some of you may have seen in the September issue of CLO Magazine, um, written by Bob Mosher. Um, and the title of it was, What's Old is New Again? And I copied and pasted a few quotes that you can see here um, that I think kind of get to the heart of what um, Bob Mosher was saying. So for example, uh, our industry, meaning learning and talent development, is full of jargon and too attracted to the shiny penny. Um, he also said that every time we arrive at a label and a methodology, um, a conference speaker or vendor ends up throwing out a conflicting term. Um, he also mentioned that when he first heard of micro learning, he rolled his eyes and thought, is this informal learning all over again? So what I want to do is recognize up front how a presentation on micro learning has the potential to be perceived um, from the practitioner side, from your side. Because basically, I'm that conference speaker that he's referring to, um, and I'm up here shining that new penny um, and throwing out and attaching a new word to a category, microlearning, um, that is still essentially being figured out um, in real time. And so I recognize how this uh, exchange too often goes, that we as the vendors too often try to tell you as the practitioners what type of training you need to give your team. Um, we reference all types of research and data points that support why this or a new type of training is effective. Um, and too often, we even inadvertently scare you or into thinking you're making a mistake if you don't adopt this one specific new type of training for your people. But at practice, we do truly strive to be more than a vendor. Um, and it's not because we love being able to share quotes like this one from the team at Cox Automotive, um, although we do greatly appreciate it. Um, but, and this was even one that, you know, I couldn't have written it better myself. I almost wanted to downplay it a bit, but Michael, our point of contact there, um, you know, gave us glowing praise that we really did appreciate. But the real reason that we pride ourselves on this is because we recognize that the most valuable exchange that takes place when we start working with a new client is not the payment, although obviously that helps us keep the lights on, but instead it's the actual exchange of learning. So we strive to be great partners because it helps us better to learn about and understand the range of problems that, and challenges that practitioners feel um, on a day-to-day -day basis and better recognize uh, you know, what the different solutions are that we can truly, where they can truly provide value if there's if they're something that practice can provide, but also if there's something that we can't. So um, with that in mind, I want to just step through what I'm going to be focused on today. And I'm going to share some context around some of the digital learning trends that um, are being talked about the most, and specifically zeroing in on, on micro learning. Um, and through the context, I'm going to try to aim as much as I can through the context of the practitioner and really how we learn through our clients what those challenges were um, related to, to these trends. Um, I'm going to touch on what applied micro learning looks like at practice briefly. Um, and then uh, the why behind where a few specific clients of ours have adopted applied microlearning. And I'll share some examples of how they used it and different ways that they measured the success. So before we dive in, um, I do think it's worth once again acknowledging the specific challenges that learning practitioners face when it comes to evaluating new or old learning technologies. There's been a lot of great presentations related to this um, over the last couple of days. And, 
I'm not sure how many people are familiar, um, and this slide got a little bit muddled, so forgive some of the lines that are probably making people a bit dizzy, but um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the work of Nate Silver. He's uh, an analyst and a former New York Times journalist um, who gained a lot of attention for predicting Barack Obama's election victory um, back in 2008. And he founded a website that was called 538, and a few years ago wrote a book called, um, titled The Signal and the Noise. And what the phrase or, or that title essentially means is that when building a statistical model, it is often very difficult to decipher the valuable signals or the helpful data points that too often easily are missed within the wash of noise and information um, that's being created. Um, and so I previously worked at a data analytics software company, and to me, the challenge that learning professionals face has many parallels to the science of forecasting or making predictions by using data. Um, if you think about it, learning professionals are essentially trying to build on a build an effective learning model that will help ensure the organization is developing and training their people to be able to meet current and future business needs. Yet, with the speed of change from the digitization of everything, it becomes more and more challenging for learning professionals to accurately assess which are the valuable signals that they should pull out of this wash of noise about the different trends and um, jargon. And in order for them to plug in what the specific learning model, um, what those signals are into the specific learning model that's best um, for them to develop in the organization to drive the business forward. Um, and once again, this is an instance where we as vendors um, often make this challenge harder for practitioners. Um, we're often overly confident that our solutions, um, you know, is critical for all the learning challenges inside an organization. And we often oversimplify the challenges by lumping it into one big challenge when in fact there are many specific learning and development challenges inside every organization. Um, I've yet to discover any single technology that addresses all of them. Yesterday, actually, Alan Partridge from um, Adobe used a great example of too often, of this example of how too often vendors present it as if there's only one big hill inside of a learning and talent development um, unit, and that one big hill is all the practitioners need to climb, essentially, you know, getting their people training results up and, and tying them to business results, when, in fact, there are multiple hills across many different business units as well as within L&D and HR departments. So with that, with that in mind, recently, Josh Burson, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, illustrated how this learning tech landscape is starting to take shape. And obviously, this shape continues to evolve at a rapid pace, but it's worth noting what Burson points to as the underlying force behind this evolution, which is highlighted in this quote where he says, today's learners want to learn when they want in the most natural way possible. And today, learning is about flow, in quotes, not instruction, um, and helping bring learning to people throughout their digital experience. Um, earlier today, I was at a presentation given by Casper uh, Mork, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Siemens, um, and he did a great pre presentation on this topic, um, but with a particular focus on the underlying base technologies that will continue to drive change in this space, in the learning space. Um, and a key point that he made echoes what Burson is calling attention to here, which is that the future of new learning tech capabilities is, is really starting to revolve around learning engagement, which means understanding the current digital learning experience and also being flexible to evolve with the employees' ways of learning will be really what guides the challenges in shaping this digital learning landscape as we move forward. So for the purpose of today, we're going to focus on microlearning, which was that top right corner of the learning landscape as defined by Burson. And what's interesting is that even within the microlearning category, there are significant distinctions to what those platforms offer. Um, so the quote I pulled here, uh, where you can see, as content grows in volume, it is falling into two categories, microlearning and macrolearning. Um, you know, this quote, along with the chart that you see, uh, really highlights the explosive growth behind the category. Um, uh, the growth was driven by vendors that he makes reference to, like Grovo and Exonify, who took, essentially took traditional content in areas like safety training and compliance and made that content more bite-sized and digestible um, and with the ability to deliver it on demand. Um, Qstream, he also mentions, did something similar with a focus on sales training. And then while Rehearsal, who he mentions, essentially offers a coaching tool um, which is more uh, focused on incorporating role play and primarily used for sales training. But essentially, the rise of microlearning as seen through this lens is defined by the type and size of the content that's offered. 
Um, so the key difference here is that these platforms are still primarily focused on building and delivering knowledge. Um, and this is really a primary distinction for how clients and partners connected with us at practice. Um, they were looking at a way to use microlearning, but not just for building knowledge or coaching, but rather also to build, develop, and assess skills or competencies in combination with those other things. And so um, in the context of the changing landscape, uh, this is a quote from Forbes that came from back in January. And you'll notice that this first sentence really calls attention to that specific distinction I just mentioned. Um, this was written by Michael Horn, who's a longtime investor and um, uh, thought leader in the education technology space. And he said, more interesting in this space is the emergence of microlearning, not just to build knowledge, but also to build skills. Um, and he did mention practice in this instance, but in other words, the specific hill that, if I'm going to continue to use Alan Partridge from Adobe's reference or uh, logic, is that the specific hill that clients are often trying to climb or the problem that they're trying to solve is not really just based on how to get bite-sized on-demand content to their learners um, anywhere and at any time, but rather how do they deepen engagement with those learners by giving them a way to practice and to demonstrate how to apply the knowledge and instruction that they're taking in through these short exercises and at the same time scaling the assessment of this demonstration and application. So um, tied to this rise of microlearning um, in the digital learning landscape, Burson also called attention to the arrival of what he refers to as spaced learning. So again, he frames us through this context of the new distinction between micro and macro content. But specifically, he asks with this overwhelming overflow of content that's hitting us in, in the learning field, how do we build an architecture that teaches people what to use when, and can we make it easier for them to avoid all this searching that needs to take place? Um, and this is clearly a real challenge that many learning practitioners face. And to return to the hill climbing analogy, it's one that applies to the climbing of many different hills, that, ex that specific challenge of you know, delivering the content, the right content at the right moment in time. And, 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 um, uh, minimizing the search that's needed. But again, there is a challenge that many of our clients have that goes beyond just this delivery of the right content in the right time intervals. And this is where tying the application and the practice component to spaced learning can be more reflective of actual quote unquote on the job um, skill building, where real time application is actually a critical component of building competencies. So, what does this look like? Um, from a high level, applied microlearning provides instructors with a way to mimic in an online setting the key components of a successful live classroom experience or training without losing the magic of the face-to-face -face learning. So in other words, how do you mimic classrooms that yield skill, de skill development but do so in a way that can be delivered to the learner in short, engaging exercises? Um, so we've, we've broken the key components of successful live classroom training into four things at practice, um, and these essentially mirror the four steps of a practice exercise. The first one is frequent opportunities to practice um, and deliberately practice, not just practicing for the practice sake, it's tied to an end result. Um, the second is peer interactivity, the third is self-reflection, and the fourth is coaching or mentoring. Um, and all of these things are difficult to scale online, and that is a big part of the problem um, that our clients are faced with and use practice essentially to help them solve. Um, specifically, you know, clients use practice most commonly for management training, you know, for both first-time managers and um, senior level, customer service training, including customer support and call centers, sales enablement, of course, um, leadership development to some degree, and even cultural development to some degree, where the real focus is fostering feedback and increasing collaboration and creating an environment where essentially it's safe to fail. So with that in mind, I'm just going to really quickly um, push through what uh, this looks like in the practice platform because I think the context is helpful for um, the client usage I'm going to mention in a bit. Um, so what you see here is an overview, um, which is what every exercise in the practice platform starts with. Um, where you can include supplemental learning content, you can tag competencies, um, you can provide instructions, and you can present a timeline. So giving essentially the background to the learner about the exercise they're about to participate in. Um, and then uh, next, what you see is the prompt and response stage. And so the first learning stage of an exercise, um, and really the why behind the stage, was to actually prompt frequent practice. And so here's where learners are actually recording themselves practicing specific discrete skills. And it's worth noting that there are three ways of submitting a video in this instance where a learner actually records themselves and then goes ahead and submits a video. 
um, which includes we have a fully native mobile application. So on the go, anytime, anywhere is a real um, uh, use in this case. Um, you can do it on a web recorder directly on the desktop or upload a file such as an MP4. Um, and it's worth noting that really the name practice comes from you know, this stage uh, essentially and, the, and at the heart of it. And so on average, our learners actually uh, re-record their videos before they submit four times. Um, we anecdotally had someone where we thought it was a bug in our platform record the video upward of 25 to 50 times for a few exercises and we immediately thought there was some issue. And, you know, there can be many multiple reasons of why someone's doing that, but the bottom line is that they're engaging in some fashion with the content that they're being exposed to. The next stage is the peer assessment. So after submitting a response, a learner's moved to peer assessment, providing and receiving structured timestamp feedback. And the purpose of this peer review is twofold. It's first, we want to mimic the social learning and building social capital um, in that camaraderie and or competition at times, um, some gamification that can go on that's so impactful and that learners often do crave um, as you know, getting and giving feedback is essentially what's most engaging and sparks further self-reflection inside them. Um, and they may often see a different approach that they like in this instance uh, or see a misstep that they want to avoid themselves in the future, something that sometimes can be missed in the exchange that they would get just from a typical manager or instructor. Um, and then we also hear anecdotally that learners really enjoy this stage, that this is especially when they're getting feedback from a colleague who essentially is in the same shoes as they are, that faces the same challenges. Um, and, and, it, and it has a different approach and it can feel a little bit more grounded than essentially getting that feedback from a manager who can sometimes appear to be removed from the realities of the day-to-day -day job. Um, and second, we do want to scale the manager and the instructor's ability to guide and mentor and give feedback. And this is critical. Very large workforces or recently merged um, workforces um, uh, you know, are, are large and managers struggle to actually give the direct specific feedback they need. And so in this instance, many of our clients are using us to basically scale that through the peer assessment. The next stage is reflection. Once learners have submitted their response and reviewed peers, they can watch a model response and reflect on their own performance. And we found that if you show learners a best practice example after they've tried a certain skill and after they've critiqued their peers' attempts at a certain skill, then they're much more curious to watch the best practice and compare their own practice, identifying specifically their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, it tends to be much more interesting and engaging for the learner, whereas if the learner watched a model response first, they often are just mimicking the performance, but don't necessarily absorb all of the nuanced differences from their own performance or behavior. And basically, that can feel a lot more like a passive lecture-like experience rather than an opportunity to engage with expert content. And then the next stage is finally where learners are provided their feedback and are coached by managers or instructors. So that coaching piece is critical. It's just not the only piece in terms of really developing a skill and a with a thoughtful methodology. But as mentioned at the start, there's four things that we see as really driving skill development um, and that our clients have helped us refine, which is essentially is practice, peer interactivity, self-reflection, and mentoring or coaching. Um, and this recap stage specifically is where coaching and mentoring takes place directly. So now with that context in mind, I just want to share a few quick examples of um, some of our clients and really, again, going back to this applied microlearning piece and why they decided that they found a need for addressing a specific challenge. And this example is Citigroup, who had um, challenges with their new hire training. And so they had business challenge related to consistency across new hire training groups and different geographies internationally, nationally. Um, they also had challenges with deepening the relationship with um, sales targets and wanted to improve sales metrics, as well as reducing time to performance. So new hires and then they're kind of, you know, released into the, the, the regular part of their work day and often there's a, there's a real challenge for them to get their performance up in the, those first few months. Um, on the learning challenges side, they um, were struggling with having, uh, being able to receive structured feedback from peers. They wanted that to be something where structured feedback would help them develop each other. Um, they also were having a challenge with scaling social learning or really sharing best practices across geographies, as I mentioned, but even within teams at times. Um, and essentially, new hires also had a limited opportunity to see their own practice and refine their value statement that they were developing. And so um, as, a, as a rough breakdown of what this looked like, the, the objectives that we did when we first started with City was focused on a couple components to learning, um, uh, really focusing on increasing confidence and the ability to communicate with customers. 
Um, also new, having new hires meet or exceed standard training objectives. Um, it was something that they were challenged with at the time. Um, and from an assessment perspective, facilitators um, were, we were trying to see if there was a confidence in actually this assessment carrying over where a way that facilitators felt like it would help them scale assessment. Um, ease of use was obvious, something that they wanted to make sure if, you know, we know better as well as you guys know that if, if there's ever um, the end user doesn't like using this product, there's going to be no adoption and, and things are sort of dead in the water. Um, and then also specifically, we do work closely with our clients in doing a needs analysis and really using our thinking through the practice exercises to take um, their expertise and their content. And so we, we do that with a services piece that we were uh, evaluating. And on an outcome side of thing, 100% of instructors and 94.5% of the learners um, actually said from an MPS side of things that they'd recommend practice, which we were, uh, of course, excited about. 100% of the participants felt the platform was easy to use and understand. 94% of learners reported feeling good to exceptionally prepared to effectively fulfill the role. And that is a critical piece that we find often comes from that peer component. It's that confidence building is coming away from these exercises with an additional confidence that they wouldn't normally have from just a traditional new hire training. Um, and 94.5% of learners said that practice increased their confidence to, to support that specifically. Um, we have a quote where someone mentioned how that it was extremely intuitive and, and you know, that this, this way of getting feedback from behind the scenes was, was helpful for them throughout. Um, and overall, the major benefits was learners were ha able to see and hear themselves in order to identify specific areas of improvement. So that peer assessment allowed them to zero in at times in a way where maybe a manager would have just been able to give generalized um, feedback. Um, they were able to see best practices from their peers in a really easy, meaningful way. Instructors were able to evaluate all learners and provide targeted and visualized feedback as depending on the group size and how they needed. And administrators were able to quantitatively measure learner growth over time. Um, another example is uh, Domino's, and this was specifically related to management development that they had with management groups at franchises. And their business challenge was that the time and the expense of the manager travel for in-person training um, was, was, was high, and they wanted to reduce that. Um, it was three times in six months. Um, they also wanted to reduce the time spent and scheduling for these three hours in-person assessments that followed this type of training. Um, the learning challenges were more focused on the opportunity to provide consistent, more individualized feedback to all participants. And there was also um, a need to try to increase more involvement from uh, senior executives and stakeholders in this type of training in a way that was scalable. So from a spotlight perspective, on the business side, they reduced costs of travel and accommodation for the program. Um, it allowed participants to spend more time in their home markets instead of you know, th uh, three times every six months flying to uh, one location. It provided supervisors with stronger data points to draw from during promotion and the decision-making process, really being able to identify more detailed, um, nuanced assessments than just one performance review a year. Um, ease of use, uh, they, they enjoyed using it and proved that practice was um, all participants were able to do it. It also allowed them to collect video content for future learning and development purposes, which was um, a really exciting challenge that they were um, happy to be able to use and develop. Um, and it incre the, increased the amount of personalized specific feedback that participants received from assessment facilitators. Um, the cost saved, it was estimated and it was anticipated around 45 to 55% on direct costs um, for an initial pilot we did and a recurring cost of 65 to 75%. And I think the recent projections are now uh, beyond that in the cost saving side. Participants saved, participants were able to spend, um, I'm sorry, time saved, participants were able to spend a greater amount of time in their local markets while achieving uh, the same or approved opportunity to demonstrate their skills. And engagement, 73% of a large learner group was invited to the practice platform and submitted a video. Um, on the content collection side, as I mentioned, this was something that was important to them. 100 plus of the learner videos were collected, which provided data points for future career advancement decisions where an instructor or manager could go back and look at the progression um, through these different videos. Um, and ease of use, 100% of the surveyed users said the platform was easy to use and understand. Um, we had a quote where specifically um, they highlighted how it enabled them to capture a permanent record of where somebody is in their development. And this was exciting to us because essentially creating this video record enabled them to look and break down the individual's performance and give them uh, something that's more insightful and fair um, because of the ability to review these previous assessments, previous uh, video demonstrations. 
And then um, this one is one that just recently came in from an anecdotal side of things and just was very exciting to us and we wanted to share, but um, also very exciting for our client. And it's a Fortune 50 company. Um, and uh, it was a specific to a customer service challenge, or challenges related to their customer service training. And they wanted to reduce turnover of customer service um, employees. There's a high, high level of turnover in, in that um, vertical. And they specifically were looking at improving NPS scores and their own um, proprietary quality metrics related to their customer service units. And based on those metrics, um, we just recently found out, I think it was about a week ago, that there was a 23% improvement in comparing four groups that went through old training um, with three months of data to the three groups where the new curriculum um, where practice and applied micro learning was, uh, was implemented uh, and then three months on the job after that. And specifically the instances where the applied micro learning piece and practice was used for quality metrics and comparative data showed 47% increase from old to new groups. So. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have some more research on this coming out in the coming months, and we'll be talking about this at the end of October at the Maisie Conference um, with a few of our client practitioners on some of the excitement that we saw behind this. And then overall, the, it's worth just pointing out again, when we think back to those challenges that our clients come to us first and when they're trying to evaluate a, applied microlearning or something like it, whether they put that title to it or that category you know, grouping to it or not, um, there really is a, a, a range of success metrics that we've had different clients look at or focus on to address specific challenges. And it does range from engagement, which I think all learning practitioners recognize can be a challenge at times, um, you know, depending on that particular hill you're looking to climb. Um, competence is clearly uh, something that's, you know, that's critical. And in that instance, um, we had uh, Dell who used us had talked about it was um, a way to help them nail down and give them a clear understanding of what they should be saying in different situations to show they were truly competent in a, in a new higher service training. Um, confidence is that one that we really think is special and really specific to that peer interaction piece. It really does bring the learner to a place of where they're more confident and feel really more um, established in their ability to run out into the workforce or, or you know, to, to run with this training. Um, behavior change is obviously something that, depending on the client, we really look closely at. And then ROI is, is a simple one. The, the you know, face-to-face instructor-led learning, I heard a statistic yesterday that still 50% of, of um, uh, I, I don't want to misquote it, but I think it said organizations are still 50% of their instructor, you know, is instructor-led training. And so there's a serious cost savings that comes with using the magic of the face-to-face -face components to uh, try to scale some of the effective um, engagement that happens in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, ease of use, again, as everybody in this field, you know, continues to hear about new technology is not always easy to use. And if it's being introduced and it's not easy to use, it's it, people are miserable and so um, it's really significant and important to try to find ways to have some technology that can help them but really is um, also something that they enjoy and are delight in using. And then service, uh, we, we do really always recognize that applied micro learning and even this sort of context that we just talked about is, is still new and it's still something that a lot of our clients are thinking through in ways to understand better. And so we continuously learn, as I mentioned um, at the top, from our clients and take that feedback so we can apply and provide the services that we think are going to be the most beneficial for them um, and for the next client that comes to us with similar challenges in order to help them grow and develop their people. So with that, that's my entire presentation. Um, and uh, I um, appreciate everyone coming. I'm sorry, I just cut the screen out. But I appreciate everyone coming and um, uh, happy to talk afterward if there's any questions. And I'm really excited, again, to learn from the perspective of the challenges that I mentioned of what may be happening out there in the, um, in the field that we as a vendor can do a better job of understanding before we come to you and say, here's a solution that's going to fix your problem. So thanks, everyone, very much.